significant role in uh, international relations, including the uh, cultural diplomacy. He started his uh, professional career in 1993 as communications assistant at the White House Office of National Services. He worked as research assistant to the undersecretary in the U.S. Department of Energy, the U.S. Department of Defense, between 2002 and 2006 as research director in the Sustainable Energy Institute. Uh, from 2006 on, uh, Dr. King has started as Globalization Planning Fellow and Special Assistant at Georgetown uh, University and is now the Director of Research at the Elliott School of International Affairs at Georgetown University. He published several publications on climate and energy issues. The most recent one is Climate and Energy Security Evidence, Emerging Risks in a New Agenda. So we have an expert on this agenda. Please welcome Dr. King. Well, I have to say the last presentation was especially interesting to me because that most recent publication was on the effects of terrorism in Nigeria, potentially on um, energy security. So I'd, I'd like to maybe talk to you a little bit after that, um, after this, about that. Um, so I, I might find myself here in hostile territory given the competitive nature of the relationship between the Elliott School of International Affairs and SICE. So um, I just wanted to um, br give a brief plug for my institution while I'm here. Um, we at the Elliott School have a threefold mission of research, teaching, and policy engagement. We have institutes and degree programs that focus on pressing global concerns such as arms control, elevation of the role of women in international power structures, extreme poverty alleviation, and promoting environmental security, especially with regard to climate change and water issues, which is my topic. Um, we realize that diplomacy no longer relies on discrete contacts between members of governments, particularly after the Cold War. We see a wide range of actors, including NGOs, multinational corporations, and civic groups, and a wide um, array of engagement, including cultural diplomacy. So for this reason, we train our students in a cross-disciplinary way um, to prepare them for professional careers in these areas. So the advertised topic of my remarks is water, U.S. foreign policy, and American leadership. So moving quickly to that, I wanted to say that addressing water challenges is an urgent and unique priority. I dare say that every country in the world shares in water challenges of some kind or another, whether they're related to droughts, floods, contaminated water, poor health, food security or undernutrition, among others. Water security is one of the most salient foreign policy issues, but its meaning is very contextual. Reaching mutual agreed upon definitions of water security is at times the intercultural dialogue in and of itself. However, um, for my purposes for teaching my course, I offer a versatile example of water security used by the Army Corps of Engineers. They define water security as the state of adequate reliable, consistent, and convenient water sources. So applying this standard around the world, we could say that one billion people live without safe and reliable water, drinkable water, and two billion live without adequate sanitation. A child dies every five seconds from preventable waterborne illness. Um, approximately, I'm sorry, a child dies approximately every 15 seconds from a preventable waterborne illness, and 400 million children are stunted in growth due to contaminated water. Close to half the people living in developing nations are suffering from ailments that relate one way or another to water and sanitation deficits. So these global demogra demographic trends provide little comfort. Um, a recent study, however, estimated that 90% of the 3 billion people who are expected to be added to the world by 2050 will be in the developing countries that are most likely um, to not have sustainable access to safe drinking water and adequate sanitation. So this situation is especially appalling when we take into account that access to water is a basic human right. The United Nations General Assembly explicitly recognized the human right to water and sanitation, acknowledging that clean dr drinking water and sanitation are essential to the realization of all other human rights. This fact underlies one of the conference underlying themes, and that is that the U.S. should assume responsibility for adapting U.S. foreign policy 
to intervene in the cases of human rights violations. So although it's not intuitive, the historical record shows that water scarcity is more likely to lead to cooperation between nations than conflict among them. The dominant academic discourse now maintains that water has not yet been a single cause of an internal war, and no interstate conflicts have been fought exclusively over water during the Christian era. From 1945 to 2005, one study shows that cooperative events have outnumbered conflictual events by a scale of more than two to one. And by conflictual events, I'm not talking about interstate war, I'm talking about small things, maybe even a neighbor blaming another neighbor for tapping into their well on a very local level. So the upside of water is that it's been a productive pathway for building confidence, developing cooperation, and preventing conflict, even in the world's most contested river basins. So I'll give you three examples. The, the Mekong Committee, established by Cambodia, Laos, Thailand, and Vietnam in 1957, exchanged data and information on river basins throughout the Vietnam conflict. Israel and Jordan have held secret picnic table talks. These were literally held in the desert around a picnic table. Um, these talks managed the Jordan River from 1953 until 1994, when a final peace treaty was signed regarding water. Um, the Indus River Commission is a popular example. It survived two major wars between India and Pakistan. All 10 nations in the Nile Basin are countries involved of where senior level um, negotiators are developing the basin cooperatively, despite verbal battles and battles in the press. So if water has an upside, it's that it has a tendency to unite people from different cultures around a common goal. However, the last three secretaries general of the UN have predicted, that the, have predicted that the next major war between nations will be fought over water, and each one of them has been wrong in succession. They are wrong, but whether the discourse over water will continue to provide an avenue for peace is questionable. National security scholars are largely in agreement that conflict is more likely to occur at the subnational level, as I mentioned among contending groups or even individuals, and that these local conflicts could in turn trigger instability at larger scales. So as water sources dwindle, geopolitical realities increasingly lend themselves to international disputes. There are 263 river courses demarking international boundaries, which represent about 60% of the world's fresh water. Rapid climate change is also a pressing concern climate change and water challenges are inextricably linked. You may have noticed this week's announcement that 2012 was the hottest year on record, and America has been experiencing the worst drought since the Dust Bowl in the 1930s this year. The Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change 19, or sorry, 2007 report specifically predicted that the average increase the average decrease in precipita precipitation is very likely in most of what I'd call the equatorial world, including the Sahel um, and the Andes. The Mediterranean, Central Europe, and Central America are more prone in the near future to droughts. Warmer temperatures also alter the timing of snow melts, threatening the water supply of hundreds of millions of people, especially in Asia and in the Andes. Newer studies contain more dire predictions than the 2007 IPCC work. We're dealing with climate change, not just global warming, so another prediction is increasing frequency and intensity of storms. We saw that in New York City. It was a one in a hundred year storm that's now predicted to maybe hit every 10 years. With sea level rise, salt water will intrude into fresh water supplies and flooding can overwhelm clean water or sewage disposal, disposal infrastructure. So all of these developments will have global security implications, but they also will have specific implications for US national security. And that's what I'd like to focus on. Recognizing the emerging, emerging national security implications of water, the State Department tasked the National Intelligence Council, the long range forecasting unit of the intelligence community, to examine how water problems will affect U.S. national security over the next 30 years. The resulting intelligence community assessment was released in February 2012. According to the report, demand for food, water, and energy will grow substantially as population increases by 2030. That's no surprise. 
But as a consequence, during the next 10 years, many countries important to U.S. national security will experience water problems, poor water quality, and flooding. This will risk instability and state failure and could increase tensions and distract these countries from working with the United States on our important foreign policy objectives. The report goes on to say that between now and 2040, fresh water availability will not keep up with demand absent more effective management of water resources. So water shortages and the ability of governments to manage them could lead to social disruptions, which in turn will combine with other factors such as poverty, poor governance, and environmental degradation in order to make state failure a plausible outcome in, in certain key countries. So the developing world will look to the United States to lead the global community toward the development and implementation of sound policies for managing water resources at the local, national, and regional levels. And the pressures will arise for a more engaged United States to make water a global priority and to support major development projects. There's a remote possibility that nations or even terrorist groups could employ what they call the water weapon um, as a means of coercion against other states or even the United States. These are depressing possibilities. However, the potential upside of an otherwise unfortunate situation is that the demand for U.S. assistance and expertise is increasing, providing the U.S. with an opportunity for soft power leadership and for stalling other actors from achieving the same influence at the U.S.'s expense. As Ellen Lapson, the um, president of the Stimson Center, observed at a recent event, the aggregated judgments of the water intelligence community assessment stands in contrast to the disaggre disaggregated realities on the ground. The disaggregation of the water issue on the ground requires participation of a variety of actors and a variety of approaches, including cultural diplomacy. In short, a whole of government approach to actualizing the upside of water across the foreign policy spectrum is necessary. That spectrum consists of development, diplomacy, and defense, the three Ds. In the area of development, information sharing is critical. Accurate hydrometeorological data is a key component of planning, and the U.S. government and other organizations, such as multinational corporations, are, have assets and are in a position to provide this sort of data. Another important factor is understanding best practices and dialogue around those practices. Such communication should involve as many stakeholders from government agencies as possible, but also individual development specialists and Peace Corps workers. The time is right for U.S. leadership in the area of public diplomacy or soft power surrounding water. One reason is that leadership will demonstrate U.S. commitment to multilateral approaches to solving environmental challenges. This comes at a time when the U.S. is seen, rightly in my view, as an obstructionist actor in this area, opposing both the Kyoto Protocol and follow-on agreements and the U.N. Convention of the Law on the Sea. So tremendous opportunity exists for the U.S. to strengthen its global, water, its global leadership role by making water a foreign policy focal point of a new soft power strategy. For example, the State Department should facilitate early discussions about emerging water conflicts or provide assistance in the development of sharing agreements in key areas such as the Himalayan Plateau, the Jordan, Indus, Mekong, or Tigris-Euphrates river basins. Second, traditional diplomacy is based on interactions between and among nations. With water, however, it can be especially effective to focus on communities of the greatest need, more at the micro level. The U.S. government has found that Pakistan is an example of a country where aid can be most effectively targeted toward these local pockets, um, which have significant water challenges and where there's more of an opportunity to succeed due to the limited capacity and oversight of the national government. In the area of defense, I'd like to explain how applied cooperation around water issues that addresses human security needs can mitigate terrorism and other global risks. Engagement around water issues is, in fact, part of the counterinsurgency or COIN strategy employed in certain regions by the Department of Defense. Global water scarcity is a national security concern for the U.S., um, in partially because the Middle East, a key region most affected by water scarcity and demographic trends, is expected to experience the problem especially acutely. Um, you, you may know that Egypt relies on external sources for 100% of its South Sudan. To 
quote the definition of cultural diplomacy established by Milton Cummings, a leading scholar of comparative cultural policy and chairman of the political science department here at Johns Hopkins. It is cultural diplomacy is the exchange of ideas, information, values, traditions, beliefs, and other aspects of culture with the intention of fostering mutual understanding. The inter intercultural dialogue related to defense and water is around achieving a mutual understanding of what constitutes security risks for the United States versus developing nations. And I'll use Africa as an example. For many Africans, security may more likely be defined by meeting the basic human security needs, such as freedom from want and freedom from hunger, as defined by the United Nations Development Report in 1994. While for the United States, security could be defined as preventing the movement of Islamic fundamentalists into areas hostile to US interests. These two goals can be mutually reinforcing, addressing human security as a tool of soft power, even in the defense context, is a way of meeting the population's basic needs while making them less likely to um, take up arms. So I'll give you a specific example. In East Africa, the Department of Defense is concerned with development of radical organizations. And the question was raised at a recent Chatham House workshop that I held, whether the high level of funding for AFRICOM, the Regional Combatant Command, being directed toward non-kinetic missions that do not require force is more helpful. And this is probably the case because water comes up more frequently than counterterrorism issues in the individual discussions that the military has with people on the ground. So in, in Africa, the US Army Corps of Engineers is operating on a more local level, um, training and emergency response capabilities, for example. And they've developed an interesting pilot program where individual Marines in Afghanistan use smartphone-based applications to pose questions to villagers about the quality of their water and other needs. I'd like to share a brief story that underscores the necessity of cultural communications in this context. In a certain African village, the Marines dug a well to cut the amount of time it would take local women and girls to retrieve water. The Marines returned a few weeks later and saw that the well had been destroyed and refilled with rocks by the women themselves. It seemed mysterious until the military group brought in what's called a cultural support team and interviewed the women discovering that retrieving the water from a greater distance was the only time that the women were allowed out of the home, and therefore their only time to socialize and be among friends. So naturally, they were eager to prolong this opportunity to be outside. So what I say is water will rarely be the exclusive focus of one dimension of US foreign policy, but I propose now that the time is appropriate for practitioners to include a role for water in every relevant plan and conversation across these three Ds of development, defense, and diplomacy. The three Ds are necessary components to build effective water programs, and what we need is the mandate to do so, the money to do so, and the people to do so. The government can't provide all three of these at once, so what we need is not only a whole of government approach, but a whole of US approach that brings in a variety of actors including civic organizations, philanthropies, universities, and individuals. Engagement around water issues is not only good policy, it's good politics. And now is the most opportune time for the Obama administration and other actors to engage water issues as a means of projecting soft power while improving human security. This is what I'd call the first 90 days recommendation to the new administration. Um, a lot of Blue Ribbon Commissions come up with these. So in my view, there are three conditions that enable water to rise to the forefront of the political agenda today. That's bipartisan support, a large constituency, and widespread popular support. So in an era where foreign aid is generally controversial, water assistance programs have been popular. The bipartisan Water for the World Act was introduced in 2011 by um, Dick Durbin, a Democrat, and Bill Corker, a Republican, has 26 co-sponsors in the Senate, and a version is moving, 61 sponsors in the House, and the versions are moving their way through the respective foreign affairs committees. International water projects, as I said, involve wide constituencies, and this gives the opportunity for individual Americans to engage in foreign policy more so than perhaps any other issue. From a whole of government perspective, water strategy brings together the three Ds, as well as domestic, scientific, and technical agencies. But from a whole of US perspective, faith communities, civic groups, educational institutions, multinational corporations, and philanthropies are all involved in delivering water assistance. Universities play a positive role in a variety of ways. Um, most 
interestingly, to provide um, capacity building and assistance that people can bring back home, especially in the areas of water engineering and public sanitation. So water is a pivotal issue, as I said, because it has strong public support in general in the United States. A 2012 Kaiser family poll found that 67% of responders believe that access to clean water should be the top US priority in improving public health in foreign countries. The global war on terror was the only foreign affairs priority that ranked higher than improving health in developing countries. A 2010 United Nations survey found 83% of Americans believe improved access to water is the most important um, single item necessary to achieve all of the Millennium Development Goals. So American citizens from all 50 states are engaged in cultural diplomacy through water. Hundreds of faith communities, civic groups, the Rotarians, the Lions Clubs, high schools, and corporations are all engaged. Information sharing and people-to-people -people exchanges around water is an important soft power tool because it restores faith in American ingenuity. I believe that American ingenuity largely defines the American brand. And the American brand is an interesting concept I, I um, discovered on the ICD website. And, and so I know it's something that, that you've probably discussed. Um, so finally, the US faces competition for leadership in soft power projection and environmental peace building through water. So, so active engagement by the United States to resolve water challenges will project our soft power, improve our interests, and maybe forestall other actors from achieving the same influence at US expense. Thanks. <laughs> Well, there is um, one example of privatization of water gone wrong, which you, you may know as a case study. Um, this happened in Bolivia. And the um, situation there was, frankly, just that the price of water was set too high by the national government. Um, so I do think it can be done correctly, but the price point needs to be reached very carefully. And, and the, um, the, the complexities of the situation economically need to be understood very well by the national government. I work with a group of people, you know, that um, through these Chatham House style workshops um, have come up with a set of recommendations and that does include, you know, senior leaders in the government and, and also from the nonprofit NGO sector. And I think what, what we've come up with is the idea of injecting a lot more funding into the USAID efforts and that, there, that would come through the embassies. And of course, that would involve you know, a certain number of contractors to the USAID. But I would hope also that that would um, plus up you know, individuals like the Peace Corps to be able to go out and access monies that are available through embassies um, to complete you know, sort of more technical projects than they have in the past. We, we would hope so, that we advocate that the amount of funding be radically increased, probably on the order of $50 million to begin with. One thing I would hope to see is that civil society organizations, you know, again, like I mentioned, faith-based communities, ro you know, Rotarians, the Lions Club, all of these um, groups that are involved, I think, can engage in dialogue and sort of be a bridge between the, you know, faceless, larger development agencies and the people on the ground. And, and hopefully the two can get together and, and reach a mutual understanding of what the needs are. Um, but you know, that's one idea. And then, but obviously, it's just talking to people on the ground and hearing their stories and paying attention to it and hoping that that's reflected up th through the bureaucracy. I mean, that's the, the optimist in me, um, but not necessarily what I've seen. And, and I think they realize that and, and that the government's hoping to address that.